be worshiping with you guys at Hawaii Central. And um, yeah, just very privileged. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers out here. Uh, just really quickly, I wanted to share a little bit about um, Reform University Fellowship, just share a little bit about the campus ministry. So yeah, we're right down the street from you guys. We're right down the valley. Uh, University of Hawaii is where I, I do uh, ministry. And uh, what we kind of do, our, our mission at Reform University Fellowship is to reach and equip students with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we reach students, so we're trying to evangelize. We're an evangelistic effort. We're, we're sharing our faith. We're sharing who, who this Jesus is. We're showing um, the gospel and, and telling people about it. But we're also equipping uh, students with the gospel, uh, meaning that, like, once, uh, sorry, the gospel isn't just for, like, becoming a Christian. It's actually for the, our whole lives. Understanding the gospel is, is a long life effort. And equipping the gospel uh, into our lives is so vital. Um, that's why we go to church. That's why we uh, continue on and, and keep persevering. We want to dive into the depths of who this Jesus is. So that's kind of our mission at, at Reform University Fellowship. And we do like Bible studies. We do uh, small groups. We hang out with each other. A lot of students come to Hawaii because it's a beautiful place and they want to they wanna vibe with each other and, and just like play spike ball, do all that kind of stuff. So we, so we do that as well. And um, we have like large group worships where we hang out and worship together. And um, yeah, I meet up with students and want to get, get to know their story as well. So uh, yeah, that's kind of our ministry in like a nutshell. Really awesome stuff. I've been doing RUF for around uh, six years now. So uh, coming into my sixth year, uh, it's been it's an amazing time. Uh, we just went to like a mission trip to Japan. Um, our students are growing tremendously it's it's been a beautiful time so uh, pray for us um think about us you know um if you guys want to support us you i want to talk to you guys further if you get, if college ministry excites you uh please talk to me if you have students if you're a student dude come on talk to me as well so yeah i just want to open up that invitation to you but um pastor daniel he asked me to come down here to to preach today and he particularly asked me to preach about being mission-minded evangelistic and so I thought a beautiful place for us to start is in the book of Acts. So I'll be preaching um, using the passage Acts 17, verse 16 through 34. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that, or it's going to be on the screen as well. So I'll just, I'll just read it out for us as well. All right. It's the word of the Lord. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens... His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be preaching of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Oropagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who, has, who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind and life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. 
Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art, by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they had sorry, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Arabagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Let me pray for the blessing of the word. Lord, uh, thank you so much for this time. Thank you that um, you've given us uh, this word for us to uh, know you, Lord. Just pray now that uh, the, the meditations of our hearts and our minds are fixated on you, that we would be um, edified by your word. Ask this in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. So when I used to work at a restaurant, and one of my coworkers was a Christian, and she was an awesome, awesome chick, and sometimes we would talk a little bit about our faith to each other. And we would talk particularly about evangelism and how hard that is or how weird that is. We would say, man, like... Like, I really don't like to do that because it feels like I'm, sh like, stepping on people's toes. That's kind of what it feels like. And I know there's many of us who feel that way as well, right? There are many barriers for people to share their faith. Some of us might feel like we're unqualified to do that, unqualified to share our faith. We might think, oh man, like if I say something, I might blow it, you know? Or we feel ill-equipped, right? Like where do I even start with that? Or some of us just lack the courage to do it. Like what are these guys going to think of me? Am I really going to come off as that really weird, pushy Christian? I'm sure a lot of us have that fear, so we lack boldness and, and confidence, and we care too much about what people think of us. And being unqualified, unequipped, um, lacking of confidence, and f the fear of man are all barriers that prevent us from sharing our faith. And imagine many of us feel that way. But our passage, I believe today, kind of speaks into that a little bit. It speaks into equipping us to do gospel ministry. And I believe that, you know, we're all called, all of us are called for gospel ministry because we're all made to serve God for his kingdom to advance, for his gospel to be known. So it's not just like the task of the ministers or, or the person on campus who's like designated to do that. It's actually a group effort. It's a church effort. Everyone is, is supposed to do that. So today... Um, uh, Pastor um, Daniel, he, he asked me to kind of help us to, to see that a little bit. And I want to I wanna really give some, some tools, maybe a framework for us uh, to, to see um, gospel ministry, to see evangelism. So God wants you to know that our God is far more beautiful, far more beautiful than any false god false idol. Therefore, we must know the idols of our hearts and show people the beauty of Christ. And I want to illustrate this through three points. Diagnosing idols, being curious about people, and showing the beauty of Christ. All right. So our passage, it begins with Paul in the city of Athens. And the city of Athens is a very intellectual city. Athens remains one of the, the symbols of, of the greatest philosophies, philosophers. 
In our minds, even now, when we think of Athens, we might think of people like Socrates or Plato and them discussing under like giant pillars, you know? There's, there's like, there's a grandeur there. And Athens, it, it could be kind of described as like one of those great city universities, you know, like Harvard or, or Oxford or Cambridge. You know, it's like one of those, like when you think of Athens, you're like, oh my gosh, all the smart people are over there. So, so yeah, there's prestige and, and intellect in the air when you go into Athens. And Paul, he's in there. He's in the city of Athens. Verse 16 says that now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So Paul, he was waiting for his buddies, Timothy and, and, and Silas, to come. But instead of just like twiddling his, his fingers around, waiting around, he went and, and saw and went, explored the city and saw that the city was full of idols. And this grieved him. The scripture says that it, his spirit was provoked within him. And this means that his entire being was provoked and grieved by the idols that he saw because the city was just submerged in it. You can't escape it. And even though these, these guys were highly intelligent, um, idolatry ran rampant, and they were pagan. See, when we think of like idolatry, particularly in ancient times, the, the, the Athenians, they were actually... Um, literally bowing down to physical objects and worshiping them. But I would argue that the Athenians aren't so different from us. Idolatry is far more than just bowing down to statues. It's a matter of the heart. In Hawaii, we have idols too. No one can say that we do not struggle with idolatry. I would say actually that that's one of our biggest problems. And that's because we are all natural worshipers. We all worship something because we were made to worship. But what is it that we are gonna worship? What are we gonna worship? Tim Keller, he describes um, idolatry as, as anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you only what God can. And the way I kind of like to think about it is, is like we have like this throne in our hearts. This hypothetical throne in our hearts. And this throne in our hearts is never empty. It's never empty. There's always someone or something sitting in it. And, and this person or thing in our hearts controls us. We are under its authority. We call it king and, and lord. We obey it. We look to it for our peace, our identity, our value, our security. See, everyone has something sitting on that throne. It could be God. It could be something else. So... A question that we can ask ourselves is, what is sitting on our, in, our, in our hearts? What is sitting on the throne of, of, the, of the hearts of our neighbors? We can have God as our king, or we can have something else. And it doesn't matter if you're religious or, or, or not. We all worship something. So those, what my point is, right, is that those Athenians are not so different from us today. We all worship something. And idolatry is out here. I want to give a few examples. These Greek dudes, right? They worshipped um, the god of money and success. All right? But how many people do you know have the god of money sitting on the throne of their hearts now? They are controlled by making more and more as if this will transcend them to happiness or security. These Greeks, they worshipped God and money and success. These, these Greeks also, right, they worshipped Aphrodite, 
who is the goddess of love and sex and, and, and um, beauty. But how many of us look to love, sex, and beauty as if it is going to complete us? How many of us look to the goddess of love sitting in the throne of our hearts and makes us think that if I have this, then I'll be complete, I'll be happy, I'll be full of life, full of, con- of, of peace and content. And love is a good thing, right? But when it becomes overvalued in our hearts, when it sits on the throne of our hearts, then it becomes an idol. And this thing can be anything, right? It can be religious performance, it could be political party, it can be power and control and comfort and approval of people. And these are usually good things, as I said, but when they become too much, they become idols. And when they're taken away from us, we despair. So yeah, as I said, I was tasked to kind of to, to give us a framework to be mission-minded, to share our faith. And I think that knowing that idolatry exists, first of all, is a really good place to start. Really good place to kind of like see with the lenses of our glasses. Like that's a really good lens that we can see through. So that's the first step. And another thing is like diagnosing idolatry is really important. And one way to diagnose idolatry is by asking us, ourselves, and other people, is like, if I have blank, then finally, I will be complete. Then finally, I will be satisfied. If I have love, then finally, I'll be complete. If I have that next promotion, then finally, people will take me seriously. If I have this, then I'll be satisfied. That's a good way to kind of diagnose the idols of our hearts and and other people's as well. Another way is to kind of understand what is consuming our thoughts on on, on a daily basis, right? What thoughts are keeping you up at night? You know, those are kind of a window into finding what these idols that we have within our hearts. Just to kind of give you guys an example The idol of success will only get you so far. Oh, sorry. I wanted to talk a little bit about, before I get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the nature of these idols. These idols, right, they over-promise and they under-deliver. They promise you much. They tell you that, oh man, if you get that, then, then you'll be good. Then you'll be taken seriously. But the idol, they promise that you'll feel complete, but they'll always keep you wanting more. There's always a next step. It's kind of like a drug. And we're kind of like drug addicts with these idols. And it'll keep us in slavery and it'll keep us in bondage. So an example of this, right, is is success, okay? The idol may whisper in our ears, we will whisper in our, in our own ears, if you succeed in this area in your life, then you will be okay. Once you get that promotion, then finally you'll be okay. But everyone who is successful will tell you that you'll be on that treadmill for a very long time. Uh, there's, this, there's this quote by Jim Carrey. I hope everyone knows who Jim Carrey is. He's a comedian, really, really successful guy. He's a famous actor as well. And he said that I think that everybody should, be, should get rich, should get famous, and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. All these, all these idols, they promise, they tell you that they, they will give you this, but they always under-deliver. You always, it's not the answer. And once, we're, once, we're, once we hit that milestone, then we won't get it. And we'll sacrifice so much to get these things, right? But they'll dry us out. So these idols, they, they over-promise and under-deliver. 
And this opens up, when we think about these things in our own lives, in the lives of other people, this can open up a lot of conversations, right, about, about, about faith. What are they living for? What are they looking to make them complete? What are they chasing after? These are all excellent conversation. These are all excellent ways to diagnose idols and to share, begin to share our faith. So you can open up conversations and we can be curious about those who we're talking to, which leads me to my next point, which is being curious about the person. So Paul, right, kind of going back to our scripture, Paul walks into the city of idols and he's very grieved. So he did something about it. Verse 17 says that he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. There's one word that I want to highlight here. It says that he reasoned with those at the synagogue and marketplace. He, 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 he reasoned with the, the people in the synagogue, which are the Jews, those who are, he's very comfortable with, and he also um, reasoned with those in the marketplace. And the marketplace was like the cultural hub, right? It was the, the media center, the financial city, the, the city square, where everyone discussed art and, and, and philosophy. And he, he, was, he was talking to them. He was, he was reasoning with them. And this word, this, this reasoning, um, is very particular. The Greek word is dialegomai, which is related to, right, like dialogue. They were conversing. They discussed. They even argued. But Paul here is asking questions. He's listening to them and then proved them wrong on their own like premises. And I want to point out that Paul ministers in very different ways throughout the book of Acts. There isn't just like one little cookie cutter way that we can be sharing our faith. To, to the farmers, he, he preached totally different. To the people in the synagogue, he preached totally different. He talked to them. He, and then to the marketplace people, the highly intellectual, he talked totally different. But in the market, he, he reasoned with them. And I think this is a really good kind of uh, methodology, if you would, a method for us in evangelism today. Because Paul, he's engaging them. He's engaging even the culture. He's listening to them, and he tried to understand them. And through that, he tried to show them who this Christ is. Some of the people that he was talking to, just for context, right, in verse 18, it says that some of the people, some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And just briefly describing these, these people, they're kind of, they're kind of like modern day, modern day people. It's really interesting. They believed, so the Epicureans, they believed that you basically like only live once. You know, they believe that the life's goal is, is, is pleasure and happiness and is escaping away from any kind of physical pain or, or trouble. And that sounds very familiar to us today, right? That's actually like half of the people, more than half of the people in, in the college campus kind of hold to that view. And the Stoics believed that, that everything is God, first of all, they're pantheists, and whatever happened is destiny. But they kind of like escaped, detached away from this world. And that's why when someone kind of describes a person as Stoic, they seem to be kind of, they're kind of saying that they're detached, detached from this world, emotionless. So that's kind of like Stoicism. But Paul, he would engage these people in the marketplace. He would, he would try to get to know them, see what they believe, and we'll see further how he, sent, he shows that. But this is an excellent way for us to, to share our faith. Um, back when, um, so long time ago when I was like leading Bible studies at like my, my youth group, 
um, we would kind of do things kind of like a round table discussion. We would just open up the Bible, and my group was really zealous, and we just like opened up the Bible and just like read a, read a, read a chapter of a book and just talked about it, right? And discussed it, trying to figure out what it meant. And um, I thought that it was great and awesome. Like, it was, it, was, it was super good for me. But then, like, I asked my wife how she thought about it. <laughs> and she told me, she told me this. Sometimes I say something and I draw a conclusion from the text, but it seems that no one is listening. Then the dudes, after talking for like 10 minutes, after talking for 10 minutes, finally get to the, the conclusion that I said from the very beginning, 10 minutes later. And it was very frustrating. And after like thinking about like what, what was going on there, why, why was that happening? It's because we were too busy, the dudes particularly, were too busy thinking about what we're gonna say. And we weren't listening to the person who was speaking. And we do this often, don't we? We're thinking about what we're going to say, and we're not listening to the other person. And it's frustrating. And it's disrespectful to their thoughts. And this is like talking to, to like, just talking to someone rather than talking with someone. A wall of argument rather than a two-way dialogue street, right? We must dialogue and, and, and so that we can properly land our points with them. Respect the hearer enough to listen to them well. So Paul himself, he knew his audience very well. He did his research. And he would craft a, a masterful argument using their own language, their own beliefs, their own philosophies, their own uh, heroes. He is, he, he is using what the Greeks knew in order to show forth Christ. In verse 23, he is referring to their gods, the unknown God that, they, that he saw. In his argument in verse 27, he's referring to their poets and philosophers. And he's pointing out their, the, their God's in, insufficiencies in how our God is near. But Paul, he was listening. and not, He was listening. He was engaging the audience. And we should model that too. We should be listening to those around us. Understanding the idols of our friends and our families and our coworkers, engaging people, conversing with them, loving them, and reasoning with them. If I want to impart one word, one word, just one word that you remember from, from this, this, this talk, is the word curiosity. Ministry is so much about curiosity, being curious about your neighbor, being curious about what they value and what they worship, the idols that are, are in the throne of their hearts. Be curious about their story, about their religion, about their philosophy, trying to understand what they're thinking about these things. And through that, we can build bridges to the gospel. We can build bridges to, um, to Jesus. Just an example, and this is just kind of off the cuff, I'm thinking about it. So we went to a mission trip in Japan recently, right? And our, our mission was to, to be with the Japanese students. So we have an RUF in Japan as well, but none of them are Christian. It's kind of crazy. So, so our mission was to these students in, in Japan. And we would like hang out with them and they would show us around a little bit. And they, 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 one day we decided to go to a temple, you know, go to one of their temples that, that they like kind of worship, they're kind of like agnostic, you know, they, they kind of like just do this out of tradition. But like this opened up a whole bunch of bridges, a whole bunch of bridges for us to like, what, what, what's going on here? Why do people do this? 
Is this something that we, you guys do just cause, or, or is it something that is really in here, you know? And this opened up a ton of conversations about Christianity, about who this Jesus is. And even like sharing, just like one of the students over there is like, tell me, tell me about this Jesus, you know? So that's just, that's just like very minor, small, small example of like getting to know, asking, being curious, and how that can really pave roads, pave bridges for gospel conversations. So to sum up what I've been talking about so far, i kind of giving you guys a little bit of a framework, a little bit of a lens about diagnosing idolatry. Knowing that idolatry exists is kind of like a really good step. And then, of course, being curious, engaging people, engaging what, what they're saying is, is so important to, to evangelism and, and, and gospel ministry. And lastly, what do we do with that, right? We must show the beauty of God, of God. Proclaim the gospel, showing the beauty of God. Continuing on in our story, Paul was reasoning with the people in the marketplace. Eventually, this brought him to the big leagues. You know, he was brought to the Oropagus which is like the upper city, Mars Hill, where thousands of, of, of statues and pillars laced in gold and silver was just up. There was grandeur and prestige there, for sure. And there Paul was, in front of the world's most exclusive philosophical review board. In the world, and Paul, being spirit-empowered, gave this masterpiece of communication. And as I said before, he used their knowledge and their wisdom of their philosophies to prove his point. But how did he do that? He was trying to tell them that the idols that they worship are insufficient. Their idols and their philosophies are too small. He was poking holes in their idols and philosophy, like a little, little piece of paper and a pen, just poking through it. So first, in verse 23, it says, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. So Paul refers to this unknown God, which is really, really, really ironic when you think about it. The Athenians, they were known to be just super knowledge-based, right? And yet they don't know their God. So, so Paul is using this as a bridge to show who this Jesus is, to show who this God is. Then he starts poking even harder he says that your God isn't big enough. They aren't sufficient. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hand, made by man, nor is served by human hands as if though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all man, mankind life and breath and everything. He's poking at these idols that they're worshiping. God can't be, can't be contained in your temples, in your idols. He doesn't need you, your sacrifices. He doesn't need your stuff. The true God has everything, has everything he needs, and gives life abundantly. All things are his. Your God isn't big enough. And he pokes even harder too. Your God isn't even personal enough. Verse 27, that they said, they, sorry, verse 27 says that they, are, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. The Epicureans, right, they believe that they have a God who is distant, who is aloof. But our God is not. He is actually not far from each one of us. 
And then he quotes one of their poets or one of their philosophers, Epimenides, who happened to be one of the people who was like, yeah, let's get this unknown God up and running. He was one of the advocates for that. And he quotes him saying, in him we live and move and have our being. He is pointing out that we have our existence because of God. Paul, what I'm saying here is Paul is showing that the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the true God is bigger and better and more personal than all these false idols that they worship. And this is such a huge thing in these ancient times. Because as I said before, these, these gods were, 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 were paved in gold and silver. They were on ivory pillars to show their grandeur. And they were beautiful. But the God of the Bible is much more beautiful, much more supreme compared to these gods. And the beauty and supremacy of, 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 of just anything really captivates the, our hearts, does it not? When we, when we see a, a, a sunset, for example, we behold its beauty. We behold it. It captivates us. When we look, just driving over here into Manoa, these mountains are crazy. It's like staring, it's like staring me in the face. I'm beholding the beauty. It captivates me. Beauty captivates our hearts. And if we are attracted to beauty, if our hearts long for that, if the throne of our hearts need that, then we must show God as far more beautiful, as far more supreme, as far more better, more personal than any of these idols can ever do. We must show a savior who descended from his throne to come near to you. Show a savior who gave up his riches so that in him we can be rich. Live the perfect life so that we don't have to be striving for our own perfection anymore. We don't have to prove ourselves with our religiousness or our accomplishments or our own beauty. Show them a God who loves them even, even though we were enemies, even though we were sinners. A Savior who, who died so that we do not need to die, so that we can have eternal life who became sin, who knew no sin, so that, we be, so that in him we may become the righteousness of God. Show them a God who gives us hope, that truly changes lives. These idols, they, they, they over-promise and under-deliver. But our God, he promises and he delivers. He delivers his son so that we can be with him. I want to end with a story that I think is, is very fitting for Mother's Day and very fitting for um, kind of thinking about our God and how beautiful he is. And it comes from this, this children's book called Runaway Bunny. Maybe you guys heard of it, maybe you guys didn't. But I'm just going to kind of like go through it real quick. It starts with a little bunny wanting to run away. And he tells his mother, I'm going to run away. And he does. And the mother says, if you run away, I will run after you. For you are my little bunny. But the bunny responds, if you run after me, I will become a fish and swim away. And the mother says, if you become a fish, I will become a fisherman and I will catch you. It's weird, right? The bunny then says, if you become a fisherman, then I will become a rock on the mountain where you can't find me. And the mother says, if you become a rock on the mountain, I will become a mountain climber to find you. 
The bunny says, if you, sorry, the bunny says, if you become a mountain climber, then I'll become a flower hidden in the garden. And the mother says, if you become a flower, I will become a gardener and find you. And finally, the boy says, if you do that, then I'll become a boy and I'll run away into the home. And the mom says, if you become a boy, then I'll become your mother and I'll hug you and hold you and embrace you. And the boy, and the boy, uh, sorry, the bunny says, shucks, I should have just stayed home. So he did. God pursues us like this, does he not? He loves us faithfully. He is more beautiful than anything that we are running to, any of the idols that we may be running to, He is better than any idol that we can muster up. This God loves you. He loves those who we talk to. Show them a Christ who loves them supremely. I impart to you this. Be curious. Listen closely. See the idols and show them a beautiful Christ. Let's pray. Lord, just so thankful for your word and how you pursue us and how you love us and how you're beautiful. Protect us, Lord, from any of the idols that we worship in our hearts. Um, Pray that we would seek you and put you on our thrones. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask for your blessings today. Be with us um, as we worship. Be with the mothers um, as they celebrate. Lord, we love you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.